Bethel Church for Bible class so we can get into the Word of God so that we can grow as saints of the Most High God and be what the Lord will have us to be, especially in these last and evil days. We thank and praise the Lord for just another day, for how he allowed us to be here in the land of the living and how he encourages us and how he's kept us through our fast. This is day number 11, no, six, eight of our fast. So God has blessed us and he's keeping us. So once we get to the end of this week, it's, well, no, the end of next week, then it becomes a downward trick because then you're just counting off days. To when the when the greater then is not equal to the less then, it's upward trend until you get to the end. But we'll we'll get there with the grace of God, and we thank and praise the Lord for all that He's doing and how He is keeping us and He is blessing us. So before we go into Bible class this evening, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious and most kind Father, we just thank you for this day, this opportunity to come before Your throne, Lord God, the opportunity to get into Your Word, Lord God, to expound on Your Word, to help us grow in these last and evil days to be the saints of God that You want us to be, Lord God. So that we'll be always on the right side of truth, Lord God. We won't be in error, Lord God, that we will grow and know what your word has caused us to be. Now, Lord God, we ask you to bless those that are sick and afflicted, going to the hospital rooms, going to nursing homes, going to rehab centers. Touch bodies, Lord God. Go to the root of the disease, to the cancer, to the stroke, to the heart condition, to the diabetes. Whatever the issue is, Lord God, you as the maker of this body know how to fix it and heal it better than man can. Remember those that are dealing with death, Lord God, comfort their hearts and their souls person might be absent from body, but Lord God, if they live the life according to your will and to your purpose, we know one day we should see them again when we get caught up in the rapture, Lord God. And we ask you to have your way tonight in this service. Let this preach, let the teacher speak not her words, but your words. Let it be the right division of your word, that the people might hear the real word of God, the truth of the word of God, so that they can grow. Bless all those that are here in the building, those that are online. Let there be an encouragement in the heart of those that are online to say, you know what, I need to get into the building, Lord God, so I can hear the word face to face, Lord God. Bless us in all things said and done in your name. In your name we give the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for the last couple weeks, we were talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And now this week, we are going to go about on a new topic, a new thing. The whole armor of God. One of the things for this year, we wanted the, the children, the, the saints of God, to become strong in the Lord. So one of the things about the strength of the Lord is that we have to put on the whole armor of God. So that means our focus verse will be in the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus. It will be in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. That's a very familiar scripture. Passes of scripture, but we're going to go expound into it. So, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And it reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your learned loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance per per and supplication for all saints. Per perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we're going to read right there. So we're going to deal... We're not going to talk about what is it. We're not going to look at the armor, so say, you know, because it says, have your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel sheet and the shield of faith. We're not going to look at those individual components, but we're going to look at the seven things that are considered the armor of God in a spiritual sense. So when you think of armor, you're thinking about somebody that's fortified and equipped to be able to withstand whatever comes against them. So you think about soldiers. So um, a soldier has different many uniforms. So when they're on land and they have um, 
or they do ceremonies, they have what they call, I'll just take that for the Marines, their dress blues. They have on their dress blues and their stuff. But when they're in warfare, most time they're in army fatigues. It's a camouflage. It, it blends in with the atmosphere. So it's like a gray, it's a brownish gray, blue, uh, black, green, army green. So it sort of like, looks like grass when they're on there. And when they're in snow, they have like a white uniform. It's all white so they can blend in. And that's part of their armor. They also carry their ammunitions. Um, some of them are in tanks. Some of them are in air helicopters. But what we're going to be equipped with and we're going to stand against, we have to deal with seven things. And he, that's Paul mentions um, here, are things that fortify us to help us to stand and help us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of the might. So what are those seven things you're talking about, Sister Anissa? So we go to verse 14. It says, stand. Therefore, having your loins right about with the truth. So truth is one of the seven things. And then verse 15 tells us, and the gospel of peace. And then verse 16 tells us the shield of faith. And then verse 17 tells us the helmet of salvation and the word of God. And then also in verse 18, it says, praying always in the spirit and watching. So we're going to look at those seven things and talk about them. So these seven things must be active in our lives to make us strong in the Lord and in the power of might. So let's look, let's look at being strong in the Lord, which is actually in verse number 10. It says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. Now, being strong means or involves these things. Being strong in this tense means to receive strength, and that is to receive strength from God, to be endued with his strength from, to be endued with strength from God, and to increase in strength from God. These things, these three things make up what is considered being strong in the Lord and in the power of the might. The scripture tells us that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And that word wait doesn't mean that you sit back and do nothing. That word wait is like the use for a waiter. And somebody waits on you. So you're waiting on the Lord to do with working and laboring in the kingdom. And as you work and labor in the kingdom, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Um, God will give them strength and they will receive strength and they will be endued or influenced with strength and they will increase in strength as you work for God. We are supposed to get stronger and stronger and not quick. So the seven things that are mentioned, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, word of God and prayer, all must be considered part of the armor because this is what God, this is what makes us strong in the Lord. We must have these things to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devils, that are the tactics, the schemes that the devil brings against us, starting with attacking with our mind, getting us to be caught up in our problems and situations that we find ourselves becoming stressful, anxious, fearful, to that the, such so to that the peace of God is dis, dispensated from our life, or the peace of God is gone from our lives. The Bible tells us that thou will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So if your mind is not stayed on the, on him, he is him, then you can't be in perfect peace because now the adversary had you flustered and gone on over. Um, now at times we do get weak and because we have trials and the temptation it does, it comes and makes us weak. But if I keep my mind stayed on him, I'm not focusing on the weakness. I'm not focusing so much on the trial, even though I'm going through it. I'm not focusing on how the adversary is tempting me I'm focusing on God so then I have the peace of God, which passes all understanding. I have God's peace so I don't have to become stressed for these situations. Life does bring us a lot of pressure upon us, and this is a time we need to run to God. Not like Whitney Houston, I'm, I'm going to run to you. I have to run to God. I, I can't run to him. I have to run to God. This is not the time to give up because it's not. that's not waiting on God. If you're quitting, you're not waiting on God. So when we look at strong, where do we get our strength from? Where do we get it from? We get it from God. So how does God give it to us? So we're going to turn to our next scripture. We're going to go to the book of Nehemiah. That's in the Old Testament. It's right before Esther. And we're going to go to chapter number 8. And we're going to read 8 through, I mean, 1 through 12. So while you're turning, I'm just going to give you a little background history on, on the book of Nehemiah and Ezra. So whenever you read Nehemiah and Ezra, you need to read Nehemiah and Ezra together, Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah together. So 
Um, this is, this book talks about what happened to Judah after they were in captivity for 20, 70 years. So how did they become in captivity? Well, what's one of the things God does before he puts judgment on you? He warns you. So Judah was being warned by the prophets sent from God to tell them to turn from their wicked ways. And he kept telling them to turn from their wicked ways. And he kept sending prophets, but the people didn't listen to the words of the prophet. On Sunday, we were in Bible class, and somebody said, the God of the Old Testament had a wrath. He did have a wrath. So what did, the, what did the people do when they didn't listen to the prophets? They killed the prophets. Isaiah, you know, the book of Isaiah, well, that prophet, he was sown asunder. What does that mean? He was cut in half. Because the people got tired of him, tell, of him telling them what good they weren't doing. And they weren't doing good, and God was trying to warn them. So because they wouldn't heed the word of the Lord, and because they wouldn't listen to his prophets, he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come on the scene and cause Judah to be held captive for 70 years. And when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylons came in, they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed Solomon's temple. They melted all the gold and silver and made it into their own idols and ransacked it. They killed the king that was on the throne at that time. So he allowed this to happen because why? Judah didn't listen to the prophets. His wrath, his, he gave warning. God always gives warning before destruction. He gave his warning. The people wouldn't listen. So in Nehemiah, we're talking what happened. So after 70 years, God felt his wrath was, you know why, he put a new king on the throne. If you read Isaiah chapter number 44, Isaiah prophesied about Cyrus 126 years before he was on the throne. Cyrus came in and defeated the, the Babylonians, and he became king. And Cyrus, one of the things that Cyrus did, God allowed him to do, was let the Israelites go back to their homeland and rebuild their temple. So that's where we're at in Nehemiah chapter 8. He's there back in their homeland. Now think, they're 20 years out, so 90 years they haven't heard the word of God. So that's where we're at. That's where, because if I just start reading, you'd be like, well, I don't get it. They're 90 years, they haven't heard the word of God. Jerusalem has been ransacked. And in this portion, when you read Nehemiah and Ezra, they wanted to rebuild the temple and they had to fight and build the walls. So here we are, they're hearing the word of God for the first time. And Ezra 8 and 1 says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man in the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. The law of Moses is what we consider the what is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, and Deuteronomy. Those are the books of Moses. That's the first five books of, of the law. And Ezra the priest brought the, book, the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning unto midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the law, the book of the law. So they stood for six hours to hear the word of God. Key word, they stood. Wasn't no cheers. Wasn't no line cheers that they could sit on. Nobody had a car and went back and got, go get that stool for me so I could sit on. They stood for six hours to hear the word of God because remember, they haven't heard it for 90 years. It's been quiet 90 years. So now they're standing and hearing the word of God. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose and beside him stood now don't crucify me, but here go. Here we go with the names. <laughs> Metatiah and Shema and Aniah and Uriah and Helikiah and Mashiah and his right on his right hand and on his left hand, Pedihah and Mashiach and Malashiah and Husham and Hashbadiah, Zechariah and Mishalom. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord the great, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen, was lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So look at how they did after they heard the word of God. They weren't seduced by the organ and the drums and the bass player hitting the run. They, it was just the people and the priests speaking the word of God. And they stood for six hours. And when they heard the word of God, because they hadn't heard it for 90 years, 
what did they do? They a man and lifted up their hands and they worshiped and they bowed and they worshiped the God with their faces to the ground. They weren't orchestrated to do it, they just did it. And Joshua and Benai and Sherebah and Jam and Akub and Shabitha and Hojeba and Mashia, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Haniah, Palamai, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. To teach the word of God, you need you read distinctly to give the sense and you cause the people to understand. When you teach the word of God, you're given direct meaning of the scripture. I'm not, I can't give them a, 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 my decision. I have to give you a direct meaning of the scripture so that you'll understand the scripture. And Nehemiah, which is the uh, Tereshah, and Ezra, the priest of the scribes, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto you. Your God, mourn not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. So they were happy. These are not tears. Yes. These are not tears of sorrow. These are tears of joy. I'm hearing the word of God. I'm getting an understanding because I understand what the word of God is saying to me. It's causing me to get a better enlightenment of God, who he is and what he means to me. And they were tears of joy. You, you know, sometimes you've had tears of joy. It doesn't happen. You just have tears of joy. You just thought of something and you had tears of joy. Verse 10. Then said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portion unto them from whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be in sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hearing and understanding the word of God, that was their joy, and that was their strength. So the joy that you get from the Lord, or which you get your strength from, is from hearing and understanding the word. Not the praise, not the shouting, but I have to have the understanding of the word, and that's how I grow. Not the preaching of the word, it's the teaching of the word that causes us to grow. The preaching of the word causes us to see something. So when you preach, when you're unsaved and somebody preaches the word to you, it causes you to realize, I'm, I'm unsaved, I'm unclean. If, I'm, if you're preaching the word to a saint, you're either encouraging them to go on or you're showing them there's an ear in the water. But when I'm teaching you the word of God, I'm causing you to grow because you realize your strength is in the word of the Lord. So the joy of the Lord was their strength. Our strength, how do we become strong? What does it say in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10? It says, let me get there real quick. It says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. I only can be strong in the Lord if I have the joy of the Lord, and I can only have the joy of the Lord if I hear the word and I understand the teachings of the word. See how it all comes together? It's like it's building on a, it's, you're building a house and you're building a foundation. And if I don't have that foundation of teaching and understand the word, the, my house is going to fall. It's going to be crumbled because I have to have, and it has to be the right division of the word. Because I can also build a false house, a house that's not like a true house. You know, the house when the when the park, huh? House of cards. Yep. <laughs> you, you, and it, and the wind come by and it blows it down, and you think you have a house. So they heard the word in verse ten. No, not verse ten. Verse eleven. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, "Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved." Verse twelve. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to have great mirth, because they understood the words that were declared unto them. Now, mirth here does not mean sorrow. It means great joy, because they understood the words that were read to them. So there was a great joy. So if you think about it like this. Sometimes when you're reading the word of God at home, and, you, and it hits you, and you realize, oh, I've been thinking about that, and the Lord just confirmed it because it's in his word. And because you've been taught the word, and you realize, okay, that lines it up. So the more you top the word, and then you go home and read it and meditate on it, it becomes clearer. Because then you say, Lord, I heard what the teacher said when they were teaching it to me. Give me an understanding so I can line it up and it becomes a better thing. One of the things we don't do today is that we don't ask God to give us an understanding from the word that we get taught. We just take it as, oh, that person said it and it's all right. But if what if I'm an heir? And you're looking at scripture 
and you ask me a question and I can't explain it because I'm going to tell you, no, this, this is my opinion. I can't give you my opinion. I can only give you the word of God. So this gives us joy that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The word of God, hearing the word of God is our strength. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. says thy word was were found thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart for I am called by the name O Lord God of hosts his joy was the word of God you know sometimes when we are down and the word of God comes to our mind or even a song that comes to your mind that reflects the word of God and the Lord just lifts you up so that's strength if God's word is lifting you up because nobody else could lift you up. Say you're going through a situation and somebody says, girl, you're going through, how you make it? And the word comes to you, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Mm, I don't have to want because God is my shepherd. I'm going through. I don't have to keep, I don't have to worry about it. God has me. He'll keep me. You know, I look unto the hills from which cometh my help, my help coming from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Who's going to bring my help? The Lord, he's the one that made heaven and earth. Because then I, and then I get lifted in that because I realize, why am I worried about it? trying to figure out, trying to see if Johnny, Sue, and May, May Ling is going to bring the, help me with the situation. And all I got to do is look into God. He's the help. That's where my help comes from. So that's what you're about. So remember, we're building on that strong. How do I be strong? Well, we know that our strength comes from the word of God. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 6. And it reads, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy time, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. What is the strength of my salvation? Wisdom and knowledge. Now remember, knowledge can also puff up. So we don't want that kind of knowledge. The wisdom and knowledge of God, the wisdom of God is the ability to take the knowledge of God and to use it in his glory in the best experience or entrance of my spiritual life. So that I apply the word of God so that I, I can live a better spiritual life. Not the best me. Please never say the best me. Because the best me is the sinful you. So if the best me in all my raggedness is sin, then I can't live the best me. I want to live the best spiritual life that God has for me. So to live that best spiritual life that God has for me, which is not my fleshly life. Which means I won't do things that the flesh wants me to do. Because that's where my strength lies from. From I have that understanding and wisdom from God that I'm doing what he wants me to do. And the wisdom of God, knowledge of God, is that strength that will stabilize me or help me to be strong against the who? The wiles of the devil. Because that's what we want to be strong against. The wiles of the devil. The forces of evil or the evil day. Because it's not just the devil, but the forces of evil. Think about it like this. Man is making laws that go against the principles of God. One of the laws they made is that you can marry whoever. And God has already said homosexuality is an abomination. So they're making that law. You know, they're killing infants, even though they have the, the ideal on the on the is, is murder, but they don't know when life is conceived. Um, but then on the other hand, they'll let a murderer go free because he has money and he can pay off his way. Look, the man is making laws, so that's the evil way. And then this day is just evil. The fact that people, I just saw a video in Milwaukee, they went into the car dealership under the cloak of night because we always do our evil at nighttime and stole 10 Jaguars from the dealership. And they had to smash down the door and they had to drive off, you know, with the dealership with the cars. But here's the thing, think about it. We all know those cars have serial numbers on them. <laughs> You got to come up for what, a week? Yeah, right. And <laughs> you got it for a week. Because when they do it, or unless you're getting ready to, to what is it, go to the chop shop and chop them up, they're usually not going to chop them up. They're just going to sell them overseas. But to come up, that's this is the day. I won't go buy a car. I'll just wait till the cloak of night. 
And knowing the car dealership got cameras on, so you dress up in a black hoodie and everything, and, 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 and you know there's always one person that did something wrong, that's how they get caught. Didn't have their gloves on, cell phone rang. But we think that's a come up. That's the evil day we live in. That really is the evil day we live in. We, we think about it, oh no, no, that's the evil day we live in. That's the quickest way. Why did they close down the Walmart in Brooklyn Center? Because everybody was stealing out of it. Walmart ain't gonna tell you that. But it was a free for all in that, in that Walmart. People was just walking in and stealing stuff. Oh, okay. And they couldn't do nothing about it. And it wasn't just outside people, it was a lot of the employees. So. <laughs> The evil day, that's the evil day that we live in. So God is going to give you strength to hold on. Remember the word of God is always to you first. As a minister, it's to me first, and not for me to tell you something that I ignore what I just spoke. Which means that you can come back and say, Sister Nisa, you know you preached on Sunday that we shouldn't do this, but why are you doing it? Because the word of God should be to me first. So I shouldn't, I can't, I can't I, all I can do is stumble. Well, you know how they do it. Well, you know, uh, the Lord gave me that word. and uh, No, I can't say that because the word is for me first. So I can't, I can't do that. So being strong in the Lord is receiving strength to endure and with strength to increase in strength. The longer we are saved, the stronger we ought to be. Increasing in strength means that the wisdom of God is increasing in your knowledge and your knowledge of God is increasing. And if you're increasing in God, your knowledge is increasing in God. Then you ought to be increasing and you ought to be at a different level than you were, say, three years ago. So we get our strength from the word of God as we serve him. So that was verse 10 we looked at. And it said, finally, stand. So we, how, do we get, how do we get strong in the Lord? We get strong in the Lord through the word of God. And we'll be able to stand and in the power of his might. So that's how we're going to be standing. So then next, and then it says, and in the power of but put on the whole armor of God in verse 11 that you may be able to stand against the wild. Stand. How do I stand against the wilds? What do I do to stand against the wilds? So let's go to Psalms chapter, the first division of Psalms 15 verses 1 through 5, which is basically Psalms 15 verses 1 through 5. So we talked about standing, so we know that. Our strength comes from the word of God, and that's what gives us our strength. So now we're going to talk about standing. How do I stand against the wiles of the devil? So Psalms 15, verses 1 through 5, which is the whole chapter, which is all of Psalms 15. And it says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? So let's let's get a definition. Who's the tabernacle? So the tabernacle was, the, was what Moses constructed back in the day when um, Israel was in the wilderness. And which was on one of the hills of Zion. So today the tabernacle is the church of God. This, we are the tabernacle. And Mount Zion is the church of Jesus. So the church as a whole is the tabernacle today. So Lord, who should abide in our tabernacle? Who should dwell in the house of the Most High God? Who should dwell in thy holy hills? It says, now we're going to talk about 11 different things. That's going to tell them who's going to abide in the holy hill. The first one, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. So you got to speak the truth in your heart. First, you got to walk up uprightly. Then you got to work it righteousness. Not, not your righteousness, but God's righteousness. And then you got to speak truth in your heart. Speaking truth in your heart concerns yourself when you're able to tell them, speak the truth to others' heart. But you must be able to speak the truth to your own heart first. You must be honest with yourself first before you can be honest with anyone else. And what helps you to do that? The word of God. The scripture tells us, thy word is a light to my path and a lamp unto my feet. The word lights up things in my life so that I can see myself or see me as God sees me. And when God shines a light for me to see me, myself and I, I see myself in the light of God, and I realize I have a ways to go, so I got to get busy working on my self. That's what the truth does. It makes me realize, oh, I'm not there. So if anybody, especially in today's world, says, I'm already there, that they're not. Because as long as the rapture hasn't taken place, God is allowing us to keep working on ourselves. We want to be perfect in what we know, 
And each day, God reveals more of us to ourselves. So we're at perfect in what we know, and then when he reveals more to us, we've got to get perfect in that. And because, oh, I just lost my thought. We want God to shine the light on us to see if the things that I need to correct in my life, I want him to show me so I can get myself straight with, with him. Because when the rapture takes place, he's going to decide who goes with him. He's not going to take recommendations. <laughs> Some people think, you know, sister so-and-so is going to give me a good word and I'm going to get into heaven. He's not taking recommendations. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the judge, the jury, and the final decision. So all of the verdict lies with him. So you, can, you can't put her up past the Lord and be like, Pastor Logan, remember when I slid you that 50 and that 100, those two Sundays in a row, I need for you to speak a good word to the Lord. You don't think about it, right? <laughs> God is the jury. He is the judge and the jury all combined. So he's not taking recommendations on how you live a holy life. He has, he has told you how to live the holy life from his word of God. And that's what you're supposed to do. So that's what the truth tells you. The truth shows you yourself when you're not living holy. The truth. And then I have to acknowledge it. Because if I'm going to be honest with myself, I have to acknowledge it when I have fallen into my fleshly self. When I have fallen into my carnal self. When I am not doing that. Because if I'm my carnal self, I can't stand against the wells of the devil. Because I'm not appearing to truth. And I'm not being holy. So if I'm asking God to shine a light on me so that I can see myself in contrast to him and he gives me time to get things right, if I do that continually, I can have the confidence that he's coming back for me. So that's why, and, and this throws people off, because when you say I'm perfect, because people say, how can you be perfect? Because no man is perfect. I'm perfect in what I know in the Lord. And then when he gives me more, I become perfect in that. I'm not perfect in the sense that I'm a perfect square and I have perfect, I have my, my, all my sides are equal. I'm perfect in the Lord and I'm perfect in the, in the word of holiness that I know and I'm growing in that each and every day. So that I'm growing in such a pace that I know that if God comes back, I'm always working on myself so he'll come back and I'll be perfect, he'll take me away. Because I know, I realize that in my fleshly body, if I stop working on me, I'll become stagnant. You know, it's, have you ever looked at stagnant water? It stinks. Food that's been refrigerated for so long, it gets mold on it. It's no good. You're no good for the masses. You then you gotta, you gotta be. You know, cheese is mold. We all know that. You grow cheese so it gets mold on it. But you have to cut away that mold part before you eat the real cheese. So if I become moldy in the Lord, is the best analogy I have ever had used. God has to cut that mold off of me. So I can become what he wants me to be, cheese. He wants me to be cheese. If I'm a tree, if my leaf, if my branches are growing off, what do you got to do? You got to prune a tree so you can go straight. Or you can prune a tree. There's a man in South Carolina. This, people are going to laugh at this. I was watching a documentary on this man. He lives in Bishopville, South Carolina. His last name was Mac. And he takes trees. And he prunes them in such a way that he makes them into like animals. And stuff. It's a whole field of gardening. I can't remember the name. But you can do that. But that's what God is doing to us. He's trimming us so that we'll be straight, upright, and fit for his kingdom. But I, if I can't acknowledge that I need his truth, or I can't acknowledge truth within myself, then I won't be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that's what we want to do. We want to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 3. Um, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. We know what backbiting is. Talking about. Um, you, you're talking about people. So he says, not backing by with his tongue. So we can't backbite with our tongue, nor doth evil to his neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Everybody is your neighbor. Because you know people go, well, you know, I live five miles out. I don't have a neighbor really close. Everybody is your neighbor. So he's basically telling you, you have to do, you can't do evil to anybody. You know this world is, you know, you do evil to me, I'm going to do evil to you. I can't do tit for tat. Nor take up reproach against his neighbor. Reproach against your neighbor. Well, somebody says something bad about your neighbor, and then you and everybody else are talking bad about that person badly. So you basically did backpipe. You did reproach against your neighbor because you know something that you know is not true. Most likely when you talk about somebody, you know it's not true. But because they made you mad, 
Yeah. You're trying to get back at them, so you make up a rumor about them, and then you start spreading it, and then people start believing that what? That rumor. That's all that is. That ain't what I heard. And that's, yeah. <laughs> and then that person is nothing like that when you get to take all that out, so then we can't do that. Verse 4, and whose eyes, of, whose eyes, excuse me, a vile person is condemned, but he honored them that fear the Lord, he that swear to his own hurt and changes not. So I'm going to say this, and they might, a vile person is a morally corrupt person. We know one person like that. His name is the former president, Donald J. Trump. He's a morally corrupt person. We, we see it. If you ever wanted to look up the word vile, he said, who, who can I be? His picture's like it. He's a morally corrupt person. We see that. He lies. He's lied. He's inflated his, how much income he has. He's inflated everything. He doesn't see nothing wrong with who he is. He's a mild so we don't look up to that person in any way. They are dishonorable. They are to be viewed as that. We don't celebrate people in their wrongdoing. We celebrate them when it's well. So if I honor a vile person, I'm not going to be in the holy hills. And that's not just in the world. That's also in the church. If I know somebody is living a shh, not a safe life, I can't honor them. I can't celebrate them because they're not living in the holy hills. Um, if you're, I'm not going to make it because if you're going to honor the wicked person, you're going to honor the devil. We honor them that do what fears, with those that fear the Lord. And then verse 5, he, and, it, and then it also says at the bottom of verse 4, it says, he that swear to his own hurt and changes not. So those are people that know that they've done wrong, but they don't change. Like, I know I'm not in the wrong, but I don't change. They acknowledge it, but they don't change. The truth is supposed to make you change. When you see the truth, you're supposed to change because I want to be like Jesus. But these are people that know they're in the wrong, but they won't change. And then in verse 5, it says, He that put not his own money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that does these things shall never be moved. Now, usury is an excessive amount of interest. Remember back in the day, they had those rent-to-own centers and when you bought, when you rented furniture from them, the interest on it was outlandish. So they say the payment is 20, I, I did it, I, I got a stereo system from them. So your payment was, for two years, your payment was $25 a month. But only five of that 25 was going towards the, the payment of the stereo. The rest of it was going toward the, the interest. So that's why it took you two years to pay it off. When, you know, if the $25 is going, Sort of thing. What was it? A two hundred, two three hundred dollar stereo? I could have had to pay it off, but because the usury was that. So remember, you can loan money to saints, and you can put an interest on it, but you don't go and say, "I loan you a thousand dollars, Pastor Logan, and I'm gonna put twenty five percent interest on it, and I'm gonna compound that daily." That's usury, cause that's above and beyond. <laughs> I'm, right now, well, who am I? I'm the bookie. I'm the person, you know, I might as well get somebody to come break your legs and you don't give me my money on, the, on every 15th of the month, you know. So that we shouldn't do that. Um, nor take a reward against the innocent. I can't take a reward against the innocent. If I'm doing that, then I am not walking or standing. Remember, we're talking about standing now. Standing against the wiles of the devil because I'm basically doing what the devil wants me to do. I'm walking in this thing. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. This should be familiar. We heard it on Sunday. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. And it says, Therefore, my brethren, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't forget your labor of love, that you do ministry and show towards the saints. He will not forget. So that, that helps you stand. Don't forget, because you have to do that to stand also. So now let's look at those, let's look at the first of those seven things that are in verses 14 through 18 in Ephesians. And the first one we're going to look at is truth. So it says, and that's in verse 14, and it says, Stand therefore, have your loins girt about with truth, and have it on the breastplate of righteousness. Truth. 
how truth has fortified me to stand against the powers of darkness, to stand against the wicked, to stand against unseen forces, spiritual wickedness, and high places. That's what we want truth to do. So let's turn to John chapter number 8, verse 30 through 32. Now, um, right here, Jesus has been going back. If you read the chapter, verse, chapter 8, Jesus is going back, talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, and he's teaching in the temple, and they've come to challenge him and tempt him and try to trap him um, in his conversation with them, and he's teaching and giving out his doctrine. So verse 30 says, and he spake these words, and many believed on him. Verse 31 then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, if you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. So it's not enough to just believe on God. You have to continue in his word. And if you continue in his word, then you become the disciples. So there are a lot of people saying they are disciples of Jesus, but they are only following his word. You have to continue in his word, which means to hear his word, to do what his word says. That's what continuing in his word. And it will bring us to a state in him to where we will be considered not just disciples, but what does it say? But disciples in deed. Continuing his word, I must avail myself to be taught. I must receive what I've been taught and take it in and live it. And what I have been taught, that will cause me to become a disciple in deed. Then verse 32 says, and we shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. What is the truth going to make you free from? error. Today we are dealing with a lot of error when it comes to God's people. And a lot of error comes when it comes with, when a lot of error when it comes to what God, what people have been taught. And a lot of error what people consider of God and what is not of God. The only thing that can keep you from being deceived and going off into error is truth. And the only way I can get truth is that I must believe on him and continue in his word. The truth of the truth shall make you free from error. If we know the truth, we will always be free from error. That's why you always hear me say, Lord, don't let me teach in error. Lord, let me rightly divide the word of truth. Because if I'm not careful, I could go off on a tangent and it don't be in the word of God. I've always said the word of God is the most truth. It is the only truthful book in the world. But if you read it the wrong way, it becomes a truth, a book of lies and error. Because it's truth. But if I teach you an error, so what are you saying what's an error? So people that worship the Lord on the Sabbath day, because it says, keep the, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Who was the Lord talking to? He was talking to the children of Israel. He was also talking and showing them what was going to happen in the seventh day. So if you know that Israel in the Old Testament is a pattern and God does everything by the patterns, signs, symbols, and patterns. The pattern was, he gave the Ten Commandments, but he had Israel do the seventh day, 30 days before he gave the Ten Commandments. What do you mean? When he gave them the manna, what did he tell them to do on the sixth day? Collect more and don't collect none for the seventh. So they did that 30 days before the Ten Commandments, which if you think about it means the Ten Commandments came 30 days after he told them to that. So that, that commandment means more than what people think. But if you don't go back to see, if you go back to look and see, oh, he gave them the manna before he told them to keep the seventh day and keep it holy. There's something more to this. But because today we only, we don't have on our spiritual goggles and we don't read the Lord, the word of God with an intent to have an understanding, we just read it in this literal, literal text. Well, you should only have church on Sunday. One, I'm not a Jew. He was talking to the Jews. He, why was he telling them to have church on the Sabbath day? Because he was trying to separate them from who? The people that were around them and cause them to be different. What did he tell us? We are a peculiar people. We are, only, we are set aside for him. We're supposed to be different in this day. Even though we have church on Sunday, just like everybody else, our lifestyle is what causes us to be different than everything else. Who we believe in causes us to be different. What do we believe in? We believe in there's one Lord. He's God, 
Jesus and the Holy Ghost, but they're all one. They're different manifestations. Some people believe there's three up there. You can ask them. People believe there's, there's three sitting up there, and they'll say it. God gave the Father, the Son, and the Son did this. And we're like, no, they're all three is one. We believe in being baptized in that name. There's some people that take the same book and they can't regulate how you can say the name of Jesus. There are some of us that are apostolic and don't understand how the blood is applied in the name. If you don't understand the new birth experience, you won't understand how the blood is applied in the name. It's just like a natural birth. When a woman gives word, what comes forth? Water and what? Blood. <laughs> water and blood. So the power is in the name. The blood is in the name. So the blood is in the water. So it symbolizes the, the blood that came when he when he died. What, when they pierced him, what came out of him? Water and blood. That's why you have to go into the, the water. water. <laughs> There's a reason. So you then you understand all that. But if you don't, you could be in air. And that's why the truth will make you free from air because then you realize when somebody says that, when somebody preaches something and you're like, Let me look at my scripture that don't sign. And God has given you that ability to do that because you have the Holy Ghost. You should be able to say, oh, that ain't even lining up. That, that, that two plus two is not making four. It's making 18. It's not making sense. So that's what it means. So when he says we'll be, the truth will make you, to make you free from air, and we have to be free from air, especially in this day because who's deceiving a whole lot of people? The devil. And he's deceiving people, not in, not in the world, because he already got them. He's deceiving the people in the church. So let's in, stay in the book of John. Let's turn to chapter 18. Verses 35 through 38. So this is talking, um, this is, he's talking to Pilate. And if you read in Matthew, if you read last week in Matthew, Pilate's wife told him, don't do nothing to Jesus. She had a dream. And the reason why is that she knew something bad was going to happen. So take it like this. If you go to your history books, three years after Jesus, after Pilate had Jesus crucified, he killed himself. He was tormented. His wife was trying to save his life. No he didn't pay nothing. Do nothing to this man. He did it. So um, that's so we're we're in this, and Jesus is before Pontius Pilate. So that's where we're going with that. So verse thirty-five. Pilate answered, saying, "Am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done?" So we have to realize Jesus' death was on two points. His death was a political death for the Romans. And his death was a blaspheming death for the Jews. So it's a political death for the Romans because if Jesus said he was the king, and we all know he's the king of kings and lords of lords, he was threatening whose leadership? The Roman Caesars. So that's why the Romans had to kill him. They wanted him dead. The Jews wanted him dead because they felt he blasphemed. He was a blasphemer because they didn't believe who he was. And they were blinded. The Lord had blinded them to the fact that he was really him. So they couldn't accept Jesus, even though he was telling them, me and my father are one, such and such. They couldn't believe it, and because of that, they were blinded. So they believed Jesus was blaspheming the word of God. The Rome, Roman, Rome didn't want him because they figured he was another king and adversary to Caesar. So that's why Jesus is dead. So if you ever hear people, and I'll tell you this, if you hear any other denominations, the Catholics are good for this. They'll tell you the Jews killed Jesus. So you can kindly correct them and tell them, no, because the Jews were not in town, charge. Rome was in charge. The Jews condemned him. Rome had him killed. Because I've heard many people, you know, the Jews killed Jesus. No, let's look at our history. That ain't even Bible history. That's man's history. J Judah was under whose rule? Romans rule. Who did they have to go to to get the authorization to have Jesus killed? Rome. If they had the authority to kill Jesus, who would have killed Jesus? The Jews would have. They condemned him, and Rome killed him. That's why, when you read about the Antichrist, why he'll be a Rome. He'll be a Roman Jew. Because Rome has killed more people than anything. Rome has killed... They did the crusades and they killed the Jews and then they did, um, they're going to kill more in the end time. Verse 36. Um, 
Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, and I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Whose kingdom is the world's? It's not God's. The devil. Yes. He's a kingdom. He's a king of this world. He is a king. So this kingdom, this world, the world that we live in is ruled by the devil. That's why there's so much crazy stuff going on. Is, is, is his. He's a prince of the power of this world. He is causing all this darkness. And that's why Jesus is telling us this, his kingdom is not here. His kingdom is in heaven. Man and the devil has destroyed the earth. So his kingdom is going to be anew. It's going to be in heaven. That's why he's not worried about it in that sense. And then Pilate answered in verse 30, in, oh, let me go to verse 37. Pilate said, therefore unto him, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Jesus is King of King and Lord Lord, but he's bearing witness of the, of the truth. He became the truth. He was God's truth personalized when they saw him. They saw the truth of God in human flesh. And he came to bear witness of the things that were spoken of God in the Old Testament. Jesus is the only person that fulfilled every prophecy of scripture that was prophesied of him and that he only he could fulfill. He came to establish what is true and what is righteousness and what God is all about. And then verse 38, Pilate said unto him, what is truth? And he said unto this. And he went out into the Jews and said to them, I find in him no fault at all. Because he couldn't find any fault. There was no fault in Jesus. So let's go back to John chapter 14. And read verses 5 and 6. Four, yeah, 5 and 6. And he said, Thus Thomas, this is doubting Thomas, said unto him, Lord, we know what not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? So Jesus is going back, when he's talking to them, he's going back to the, the um, office of fathership. Um, he has once he went back to heaven, he was no longer the son of God, which he was here on earth. So who took his place as a son of God? The church. So today the church as a whole is his spiritual son, which is the church. Collectively, we are the sons of God. Collectively as a church, we are the son of God. Individually as people, we are the sons of God. So that's how it is. So he's taken, he's no longer in his, once he ascended and went back up to heaven, he went back to the place of fathership. Verse 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, for all those people that feel that you, you can know Jesus on your own, you must have the gospel preached to you. That's why it says many are called, but few are chosen. By a minister that has been called, prepared, and sent to the church, you must be baptized in the name of Jesus by somebody that has already been baptized in the name of Jesus, born again. You must be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost through the church. That's why the, the scripture says... Zion has travailed and brought forth. So nobody can get to God except they come through the church or through his son, son his spiritual son. So his spiritual son is the church. So all those people say, you know, I, I just have a relationship with God. I don't have to go to church. You got to come to the church because you got to be baptized by somebody that's already been baptized in Jesus' name. And then you got to receive the Holy Ghost. And you usually free the church because somebody, somebody has to fulfill there has to be an acknowledgement of you getting the Holy Ghost. So somebody has to hear you speaking in other tongues to acknowledge that it's what? The Holy Ghost. You just sit at home speaking in other tongues to yourself. Somebody has to acknowledge it. So if you live by yourself, who's acknowledging it? The wood? Is it the wood is going, the wall is going to come in here. I acknowledge that Sister Lisa received the Holy Ghost because I was in the apartment with her. Believe me, if the, if the walls of your apartment walked in here, there would be nobody left in the church. <laughs> So she was there and I heard her. No, so you have to be. That's truth. See how that works? That's the that's the, the truth. And then John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. I hope this, you get an understanding of the truth we're talking about so that you know it's not just any old kind of truth. It's, it, it, there's more to this truth than because it's not Ray Ray's truth. It's not Anissa's truth. It's the word of God's truth. All right. <laughs> Because anybody can have a truth, but if it's not Jesus, it's the truth. So verse 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. And it reads, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. 
because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We have come out of what? Darkness into his little marvelous light. So we, little children, have overcome the world because greater is he that's in you than is in the world. Who's in me? Jesus. And he's greater than that's in the world. Verse 5. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. He's telling us. And so he said, who are, the, it says they. Who are the they? Well, if you go back to verse 1, it says, Beloved, lead not every spirit, but try the spirit where there are many, but by, try the spirit whether they are of God. Because many, what? False prophets. There are false prophets in the world. And then verse 3 says, and everyone that confesses not that Christ, Jesus Christ has come to the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Those are the things that he's talking about in verse 5. They speak the, therefore, they speak of the world, and the world hears them. Because they're not speaking of God, the world hears them. Because the world believes who? The devil. So if you're not speaking about God, the world will hear you. So any teaching or religion or belief that says Jesus is not the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and all three are one, is Antichrist. And that's according to this scripture. To these scriptures, but not just that, but to many scriptures. In verse 6, it says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby we know the spirit of what? Truth and the spirit of error. So he's not talking to, when he says verse 2, he's not talking to people in the world, he's telling them to the saints. He's telling them that if we're of God, he knows, he that knoweth God hears us. So if you're preaching the word of God, and it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's not the word of God. I can't hear you because it's not the truth. you got to have that truth so you can preach and not fall into, hear by the spirit of truth and error so that you don't fall into error because there's a lot of error going on because of deception. And that's what takes us to our next verse, which is James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. So all this about truth, I know you're like, well, all, you could have just said truth is truth, but you got to lay the foundation for truth to understand that it's God's truth. And for, um, James 5, verses 19 and 20 reads, 19, the love, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one converts him, convert means bring back unto the truth because he has gone into error. This is talking about somebody that's in the church. So how are they in error? They are not hearing God. They're not listening to the pastor or the leadership that God puts over them. Then verse 20, it says, Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the heirs of his way shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. So now they're a sinner. First they were a brethren. They were say, But now because they're still dwelling in error, because they've been deceived, um, they have left the truth. Now, they haven't gone back out into the world to sin. Because you know, when I said sin, you're like, oh, they're sin. No. But they have erred from the truth of the word of God. Most people today don't want to be corrected as saints of God. And you have to be willing to be corrected as a saint of God. It's not just corrected by a person. Sometimes you read the word of God and it, it corrects you. Sometimes somebody teaches the word of God and it hits you and you realize, oh, I was in error. And you correct yourself. Um, I have to be willing to be correct. The scripture tells us that knowledge puffs up. And many today are puffed up because of so much knowledge. If the devil can't get you to sin, he will push you so far forward that can't nobody tell you nothing because you know it all. Multitudes of sin. All the other people that they have deceived because they feel that they know the truth. The devil comes to deceive people, and those that have been deceived think that it's their bound duty to tell us that are living right that what they have is the truth. You ever notice that? Somebody that's living something, you'd be like, and they always got to tell you, no, it's like this, it's like this. And you're like, no, that, no, no. Because they have become a deceiver, so they have to deceive as many as they can. And they don't, here's the sad part. Because they're in air, they don't realize that they've been deceived. Which to me is scary. How you read the word of God and you just go off into another tangent. So when it says you you have you have hit a multitude of sins, that means you have, if you got that person that was a deceiver corrected, 
the people that he has deceived, now he has to go back and tell them what? The truth. So you've hid a multitude. You called a multitude of sinners to come back to the truth. So James is not talking to the people in the world. He's talking to the church. Because once you become deceived and you walk into the spirit of error, you become a deceiver. And what happens when people listen to you? They become what? Deceived. So if you get corrected as a deceiver and you go around and start telling the truth, what have you done? You have saved a multitude of people from their what? Sins. So, two more scriptures. Um, Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. 15. So um, while we're going there, this is Joshua's um, deathbed sentence message to the children of Israel, just like Moses did his. Um, verse 14 and 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in serenity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto, to, unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whom the land dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What we want to get to is that we, have to, we want serenity and truth. You can't have one without the other. We must have both with our truth. So serenity will keep you bound in truth because you will have a sinceness of your heart to know the word of truth and want to be true. Truthful. And then our last scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 through 8. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. This is my own question. It's a long question? No, it's my it's oh. my own question. Yes, ma'am. So, I don't know what's going on with the mic, but um, so when you were talking about serenity, what about if there's unevenness or not no serenity in your home, like your physical home? So he's he's talking about you spiritually. Some of us do have un, our houses. Some people, especially if we live in a house that's not, not everybody believes in the Lord. But the serenity has to be in you. It has to be in you. It has to be because you're so seer walking towards the Lord in that serenity and peacefulness with God, he's going to lead you into all truth, even though you're living. We all live in a world of confusion. We go to work, there's confusion all around us. Oh, sometimes in our homes, there's confusion. But yes, he wants it to be in you. It's not around you, but it has to be in you. In um, our last scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Does that answer your question? Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. So, this is, this is very deep. So, it is commonly, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Such fornication, and there's not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So, what he's telling, this is Paul talking to the church of Corinth. This is the church that he pastored. There was somebody in the church that was doing some fornication, and we know fornication is a broad term for sex outside of the, the, the laws of marriage. Any time of sex outside of the laws of marriage. Homosexuality, Beastology, anything that's outside the long way. He's saying that there's such a fornication among you that it's not even named on the Gentiles. So at that time, the Gentiles didn't know what it was. This was a man having sex with his father's wife. We call that incest. We do now now call it incest. This was happening in the church that Paul pastored. So we are Paul's talking to the saints. <laughs> so I don't know why he's talking to his church members. And ye are puffed up and have not, and are not rather mourned, that he that does this deed might be taken away from among you. So the whole church was in sin. And they, sh they, they should be mourning the fact that this man had sinned, but they're not. They're glorying in it. Which, when we read it, it sounds strange. For verily, as I am absent in body, but present in spirit, having Judge already as though I were present concerning that him that had done such things. So Paul wasn't there with them when he wrote this letter. He was in jail. He was out ministering. He was, he was not there. So in his spirit, he's writing that the wrong that they're doing. Verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when, when we shall gather together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus, when I come back to you, I'm going to tell you to deliver such a one unto Satan. So... This person that has committed this sin, has done his incest, he needs to be put out of the church, which we call 
disfellowship. But instead of putting them out of the church, the church is gossiping and talking about him. Instead of judging him and telling him, brother, you've done wrong. You need to be put out of the church. They're not doing that. So this is a whole church is now in sin because instead of taking out that evil that's in the church, they're talking about him. No one is holding him accountable because he's having sex with his father's wife. Um, and it says, uh, verse 5, to deliver such a to, to save it for the destruction of the flesh. Why destruction of the flesh? Destroy the sin that's in the body that he may see that he is wrong and have to be put out. And God can work on him to bring him back to repentance so that he can be what? Saved. So when they used to disfellowship you back in the day and put you out of the church, they're putting you out because they wanted you to see the error of your way. And then you're, you can't, you could come to church, but you couldn't do nothing. When you're sat, okay, I just, you sat down. You couldn't do nothing. You just All you could do is just sit there. You couldn't shout or nothing because they wanted you to see the error of the ways. You've done something wrong. Now when you get it right and you get repentant, and when he wrote the, the lips letter, chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, which is a year later, in chapter 7, there's the seven fruits of repentance. And he shows you when you have sinned and God has put you on judgment, some these seven fruits should be in you that you very, you don't want to sin. And you shouldn't have to sin. Is there a question? No, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, but when you, I know why they did it in the old church. But do you feel that they don't do it now because it's all about if you say you have a musician? I know it's just, I'm just using random. You have a musician and you know he's sinning. But if you lose that musician, then your church ain't popping. There's no musical ministry, you know, and stuff like that. And where before in the old days, it'd just be like, okay, we ain't got no organist. You know what I'm saying? We yes. just gonna sing. So if the church is be what the people like, that's what he says, what the people like. So because the people want to have the musician, I'm not gonna put the musician down, even though I know he's sinning, where you should. And Paul is saying why? Because what happens is that it causes um, it caused interference in the church. Because now you're telling me, oh, he can live like that, then I can live like that. So do you feel that people don't believe a church can have a spirit? Like if you yes. have a, 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 a pastor or something that has a spirit of lust, an adult, you can have that. If you have a pastor that doesn't, you know, struggling with the sexuality, you can have that or, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it, is it just that? A lot of it is because most people are not learned in the scriptures no more. To be learned in the scripture means you have to study the scripture. Sometimes you have to go back and find the teachers of the fathers. Because a lot of the fathers, because they were uneducated, God gave them so much doctrine and knowledge. If you go back and listen to them and they start reading the scriptures, you'll get a better understanding. And you can't lean to your own understanding and try to apply your opinion to the word of God. You need to get the word of God to, to reveal it, line upon line. So it's not just a quick study of the word of God. I have to be able to, to search the scriptures to make them make them work together. And But because of the day we live in, in the Laodicean age and what the people want, a lot of churches are, are being programmed for what the people want. So I'll let that stuff slide because I got 2,000 people in my church. And it's popping on Sunday. But of them 2,000 people, how many are really living a holy life? All you see is that. So, yes. And that's why it's the, 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 the devil is deceiving the, the, the body of Christ. He's not deceiving the world. I mean, we see that. Yeah, some people are being deceived, but Donald Trump, that's just the evilness of him. You know, his narcissist himself, he, you know, he can't do no better. But people in the church are really being deceived by the adversary walking in the light because of what they want. He, he, they won't sin, but he gets them, I know more than you. You know, I, I got this. You know, everybody has a new revelation. Everybody, somebody's spoken to me. Why does everybody have to have somebody speaking to them? Doesn't God speak to us every day? Isn't God the only person that wants speaking into me? That's just me. I don't know about anybody else, but I only want the Lord speaking into me. I don't need you to speak something into my life. God has already spoken something in my life. He gave me the Holy Ghost. 
but people that they, they don't feel validated unless someone says and that's my if flesh. i'm saying oh josh i'm speak uh, this 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 you know i mean i could be leading josh down a wrong way the wrong way if and it we, wasn't we, from god and if it's not of us poof, poofing ourselves up yes that knowledge so yes you're so um where are we at verse seven seven Purge yourself, therefore, the old leaven, that ye might be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed. So, for you to be forgiven is going to take the same blood that was sacrificed for us when we first got saved. That same blood will cleanse us from the leaven, leaven and sin that is in us. So, as saints, even though we've been baptized Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost, we can err into sin. I know people, no, you can't. Yes, you can Sin and faults are two different things. But when I sin, I confess my sin and get it right. And what he's telling you is the same blood that Jesus shed to save you the first time is the same blood that's going to cleanse you of the sin. You just got to confess it. Um, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. I can't keep the feast with the old leaven, with the sinful nature, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we have to have that sincerity and truth. And we have to get that living out. Paul was talking to his whole church, the whole Corinthian church. The church had become unsaved because of one person. And then everybody else was sitting around gossiping and talking about it. And nobody had enough will for her to say, brother, you're sinning. You need to come out of the church. Yes, what Sister Toya said, sure. we are, today we're living in the church age where there are a lot of people sitting in the church sinning. And we don't have the willful law to say, you're sinning. You can't do that in the house of God. You can't live that life and say that you're saved. You can't live that life and say that you're a representative of Christ. I need to, you can't do this. And even if I was sinning, sometimes you don't have to tell me if I'm sinning. Sometimes I need to sit myself down. But today we don't have that word for all to say I need to sit myself down. I'm going to tell the pastor that I'm sinning, but I'm also telling him, pastor, I need to sit myself down for 30 days because I am not living right and I need to get myself back in the place. We don't have that word for all today. That's what the truth is he's talking about when he says in verse number, um, what's it? Uh, uh, having your lawns go about with the truth. That's the truth that he's talking about. That truth that it kind of makes me hold myself accountable when I look at God, when I look at myself in God's mirror. That truth that has a serenity to it. That's the truth that you learn knowing your your. Um, having your loins guarded with truth. That's what you have guarded because it's, it's God's truth. And the devil can't break God's truth. He knows that. And that's what you're going to need to fight against the wiles of the adversary. I can't fight against the wiles of the adversary with error in my life, with not understanding, with being, how am I going to fight the devil when he's already deceived me? I, I can't. Because he ain't even going to fight me because why? He already got me. You don't fight your own self. Oh, no. But he fights against us that have that truth. So we got to the truth. We got six more to go. So we'll stop right there. I know there's a, there was a whole lot, a whole lot, a whole lot. But I hope you got something out of that whole lot. So you know that means we'll be on this. Next week you get a reprieve. So if you want the list of scriptures that I have, I can give them to you. I can make a list and we can put them out there. Uh, we thank you for tuning in. Um, come back next week. In two weeks, we'll be back on the um, Hour of God. Next week, the Lord says the same. Um, Elder Albert Green will be here teaching the Bible class. We don't know what he's teaching, but it is the third Wednesday of the month. Um, just thank you and praise the Lord as you gather in your offering, if you want to give offering this evening. Um, upcoming events, this Sunday is our third Sunday, and it's also our Bible giveaway. So if you need a word of God, if you say, I, I would like to come to church, but I don't have a Bible, this is a Sunday you can come join us here. At Apostolic Deliverance, we'll be giving away Bibles. Um, and then on Friday the 29th is our communion and foot washing service. And then the first, no, it's the second Friday in April is the MWDDC prayer conference. And I'll have that slide up there for Sunday. And it is at a church in St. Paul, one of the new pastors. It's on North Hazel. There's so, one on fifth and sixth. In the fifth and the sixth, yes. Yeah. So we'll have all that information. Yeah, I have that up on the But we thank you all for joining us. We thank you for allowing us to come into your house and hear the word of God. And those that are in the building, we thank the Lord for you being here. 
So let us dismiss this service with a word of prayer. Gracious and most kind Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to magnify and bless your name. We thank you for just being God and allowing us to be here today. Now, Lord God, let us take this word, let us chew on it, let us eat on it, let us meditate on it, so that we can grow in our hearts and be what your helps to be, and we can put on the whole armor of God. Now, Lord God, bless us as we leave this place, never from your